Good morning. My name is Chuck Riley. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. And it's my privilege to welcome you to the first in our fall series of leadership lectures sponsored by the uh, Engineering Leadership and Innovation Institute here in our college. This morning, our speaker is Mr. Lyndon DuPont, who's Vice President of the North Central Region at Florida Power Corporation of Progress Energy. That company has more than, tw he has more than 22 years of progressively responsible experience in a company with revenues of approximately $10 billion. Progress Energy Florida Incorporated engages in the generation, transmission, distribution, and sale of electricity in Florida. It operates oil and gas, coal, and nuclear-fired power plants. Progress Energy Florida provides retail and wholesale electric services to approximately 1.6 million customers. Its service territory covers approximately 20,000 square miles in Florida and includes the areas around Orlando, as well as the cities of St. Petersburg and Clearwater. The company was founded in 1899 and is based in St. Petersburg, Florida. Mr. DuPont has spent 15 years as an operating leader in a variety of business units within Progress Energy, including engineering management, distribution operations management, region service management, resource management, contract management, vegetation management, metering services, construction process management, and plant operations. He has led these business units through startup, turnaround, survival, and growth modes. His understanding of operations, planning, and execution encompasses safety, engineering, customer service, system reliability, power restoration, project management, asset management, financial management, work plan development, business pro process management, union labor management, and organizational design. As you can tell, he's been a busy man. Linda DuPont holds a Bachelor of Science degree in electrical engineering from Florida State University. And I learned this morning the most interesting thing about him is he was on a basketball team. He was obviously the captain of the basketball team that beat Deion Sanders' team in intramural basketball at Florida State University. So that's, that's <laughs> tremendous. And he's here this morning to speak to us about collaboration, building relationships, and trust. It's my privilege to welcome Mr. Lyndon DuPont. Good morning. Okay. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm glad that you are here. As I thought about being a speaker on a Friday before a three-day weekend, I was worried that there would be nobody here because 23 to 24 years ago, I was, would have been in your seats, and I'm not certain I would have actually been here on a th three-day weekend. So thank you for joining me. Uh, I am here to talk about three objectives today. I want to give you kind of a brief overview of Progress Energy, the utility company. We're part of the energy sector. And I remember when I was sitting in your chairs 23, 24 years ago, the utility industry to me wasn't something that I actually had an appeal for. Uh, my background is that I, my electrical engineering degree was in digital signal processing. I had a graduate uh, plan that I was going to go work with a Dr. Kwan at FSU who had some grants with NASA, and that's kind of where I thought I wanted to go. And, I, and all of a sudden, I interviewed with Florida Power at the time, and it kind of was very attractive to me. And so hopefully I can give you an overview about the utility sector, and maybe it may appeal to you. The second objective I want to have is I want to kind of tell you a little bit about my story of professional growth and leadership development. And then thirdly, I'm going to give a, a peer of mine who came and spent some time at our uh, power company uh, a couple of months ago and uh, let him share a little bit about his experience, uh, both of the type of jobs and that he performed as well as his leadership experience. So that's kind of what I'd like to cover with you today. Okay? So let me see if I can operate this. Now, I don't know what you guys were thinking, but when I heard Chuck describe my experience, I was wondering, you know, what you guys were thinking. I was thinking that this guy can't keep a job is what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I have been employed for 22 years. Uh, I work for a Fortune 500 company. And uh, we currently, at the end of 2010, we were ranked at around 238. So we're a very big company. Uh, you can read the statistics for yourself. I would like to talk a little bit more about things that are important to me, which is developing the economic community that we have and investing back in the community. 
Uh, since 2010, when Progress Energy became Progress Energy as a result of the merger of Carolina Power and Light and Florida Power Corporation, uh, we have invested in the economic community by attracting over 167 companies to the state of Florida. That's translated into roughly about 26,000 jobs. And on top of that, just as part of our standard capital investment plan, we've invested $10 million of capital into the state of Florida. What does that mean? That's, again, additional jobs, additional opportunities for young, innovative engineering minds. Uh, some of the companies that we've brought to Florida, here in Orlando, the Mitsubishi Power Systems Company, in our St. Petersburg area, we brought both Jabil Circuits as well as Draper Laboratories. A uh, little bit about our philanthropic investments. Uh, we've invested around $40 million over that same period of time, of which roughly about $15 million was toward educational institutions like UCF, $10 million toward economic development and the arts, and another $10 million toward health and social services. Something that you may be thinking, okay, community, why is that important? Well, you need to give back to the community. That's part of some of the leadership conversation that we're going to have a little bit later. And our company is very proud that we not only give roughly $40 million over that period, our, our employees have given over 9,000 hours a year to these communities and charities. So it means a lot to us. Um, as I stated on the previous slide, um, We've invested roughly $10 million in our systems, and we've invested $40 million in communities. But something, when you think of the power company, you think that you think about flipping that switch. Reliability is very important. Our engineers spend a lot of time thinking about ways to improve reliability. And you can see from that statistic that we've improved reliability by 40% over that 10-year period. What does that mean? We have less outages, and we restore outages quicker when they're out. What, that, what does that mean for the customer? More reliable service. Safety, that's actually our number one priority. And we feel that when it comes to safety, if you follow the procedures around safety to protect yourself, you'll do all the other procedures. And we, we put a lot of emphasis on that, not only from a process perspective, but from a people perspective. And as you can see, we've improved uh, safety by over 77%. Fast track is one of the ways that we measure customer service and we continue to improve upon that. As I talked about before, we've invested $10 billion in our capital and we've increased our power plant reserves. Uh, one area that will may resonate with this group is that we've also spent a fair amount of money on improving our, eco our environment. Uh, we've, in, we've reduced our NOx and SOx emissions by over 70% over that same period of time. And that isn't cheap. I mean, we've got one investment in our Crystal River 4 and 5 plant that was a billion dollars. Ultimately, we had a coal-fired plant that we spent a billion dollars to reduce the amount of emissions associated with NOx and SOx. So it's a big commitment, and it's important that we have to be a quality environmental student. Uh, storm restoration is another thing that we're good at. That's a good news, bad news story. Uh, if you were here in 2004 and 2005, you saw a lot of hurricanes come through. We got so good at it that the Edison Electric Institute has awarded us the Emergency Response Award five years, which is an industry record. We recently had a chance to go help our sister company when Hurricane Irene came through this past week. I had to spend a couple of days up there supporting the troops. A little bit about where we are heading. Um, if you haven't paid attention to the news, um, we're merging with Duke. It's a match of really two equals. Uh, we're going to be the biggest as well as the best utility in the nation. We're going to take sort of the best operational experience from Progress Energy and the best operational experience from Duke. And we're going to put it together and we're going to be the best. Now, some statistics for you. We will have the largest uh, uh, generating fleet, the largest number of customers, the largest number of assets in the entire U.S. market. What does that mean? That means we're going to actually have more capital to invest. Well, what does that mean to folks in this room? More opportunities. We'll be able to invest more in electric, or in help invest in electric vehicles, energy efficiency, demand side management. There's a lot of opportunities that we see in the future that this is going to open up. All right, now that I've gotten through the boring 
uh, progress energy performance and statistics. I know my PR department will be happy that I've covered those statistics. But let's talk about what we're here to talk about. People. That's progress energy's most important asset. And if you're going to be a leader, no matter where you're at, you've got to keep that in mind. We have a culture statement that it's people, performance, and excellence. If you take care of the people, you make sure they're trained, then you'll lead to performance, and then it'll ultimately lead to excellence. Um, I'm going to talk about my personal growth and my leadership experience, but in reality, it could be any leader at Progress Energy because it's more about the culture that we've built at Progress Energy from a leadership perspective and the standards of which we set and we hold our leaders to. Now, a little bit about Lyndon DuPont personally. I'm a native of Florida, Plant City, Florida. My folks uh, settled in there sometime after the Civil War. And everyone in my family are a bunch of educators. My father was a principal, my mother was an English teacher, and my aunt was a science teacher, and my uncle was the assistant superintendent of schools in Hillsborough County. So education's in my blood, so I'm excited about being here in front of an audience. They would be very proud of me. Um, I started out at FSU majoring in business. I was going to be an accounting major. Why? Like many of you, I wasn't certain as to which career that would fit for me. My sister was an accountant, so hey, seemed like a good thing for me. Um, interestingly enough, by the time I finished my second year, I had completed my entire physics series and my calculus series, and I was getting straight A's in those, and I was getting you know B's in, in the business school. So my business advisor sat down with me and said, well, what do you really want to be? And he, he sent me over to talk to the engineering advisor, and I changed my career to electrical engineering with the emphasis in digital signal processing. As I started out the conversation here today, I thought I wanted to go to grad school. I was a hardcore engineering technical guy. I loved the numbers. I loved the math. And I interviewed with a company out of St. Petersburg, Florida, named Florida Power Corporation, which is now Progress Energy. And they had a skills assessment as part of the interview process where they identified I had people skills and leadership skills that they felt were valuable. Again, I had the technical leadership, I had the technical piece, they actually helped identify the leadership piece. The technical piece is what's going to get you in the door. The leadership piece is what's going to cause you to advance. Because if you don't have both of those, you won't be very successful in any leadership career that you decide to pursue. Okay? So, I really like this slide. Tim Cotner uh, with the, Inter the uh, Leadership Institute is the one that first shared this with me. And, you know, the only thing I would change about that slide, instead of that skateboard, I'd put a basketball, and then I have a picture of Dion with me dunking on him. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is intended to sort of give you kind of an evolution of you as a college student to hire an own with a company, we'll say Progress Energy, where you're dressed in khaki slides and a nice Oxford shirt, where you're now that entry-level engineer, and then you're progressing on to be more of a leader, and then ultimately you're over in that executive side, now you're leading organizations, okay? Now, what I want to do is kind of paint a picture as to how I came and evolved through that particular process. Uh, as I stated before, Florida Power Corporation did a skills assessment upon me and found that, hey, he's got leadership and people skills. Uh, they understood and knew that engineering students that graduate out of a major university in the United States are very, very bright. But they also understood that if they can't work together as a team and work in a collaborative environment, that we won't be very successful as a corporation. So as part of their interview process, as part of their skills assessment process, when they, br they would bring down teams of engineers, eight to 10, and they would break into individual rooms, and we would do inbox assessments, we would do uh, tape speeches to say how we would motivate the troops, we would write uh, documentation, and then we would come to a boardroom, and we'd have a problem to solve, and then they would, had given us all the information, and they observed to see, did you work collaboratively? Did you take a leadership role? And from there, you had managers sitting around who assessed if the engineers brought those type of skills to the table. I was lucky enough to be one of those folks that they felt had that capability, 
And as a result, they put me in a leadership program, a fast track management program. And for the first 18 months of my career, I was basically given the opportunity to learn the company, develop operational skills to prepare me to go out and be an engineer that had leadership capabilities. My first assignment was in Deland, Florida in 1990, September of 1990 to be exact. And I'm coming from St. Petersburg by way of Plant City, by way of Florida State University. And in 1990, uh, the power industry had a lot of experienced individuals, 20, 30, 40 years in that Deland territory. They had been doing that work for a long time. Something else was happening at that time. Desktop computers were first being introduced <laughs> to communities. And an opportunity presented itself for me with my collaborative skills is that I recognized that the engineers that were working up there, and I also recognized that the customers that were there were kind of at odds with each other over the power quality that we were providing and that they were receiving. Because the, of the new technology <coughs> and because of our old technology, our voltage monitoring systems were not sampling data at the rate needed to be able to analyze the quality of the voltage that computers needed. Now, another lesson for leadership for engineers, you do not know everything. When you hire on to a company, you must know and you must believe that you don't know everything. I knew the technical piece from having come out of college, but these people that had been around 20 and 30 and 40 years knew the troubleshooting piece. So I did not barge in there to say, hey, I think I got a solution. I, my, the first thing you're gonna hear about and when we get to the next slide is the first thing you gotta do is build a relationship. How do you build a relationship? You respect people. You understand that they know more than what you know about what they're talking about. You understand that, hey, I can learn something from everybody I'm with no matter what position they hold. And then you start asking questions, okay? And you'll be surprised at what people will do for you if you build respect. Then the second thing you do is you actually then turn around and help deliver a solution, okay? And that's how you apply your operational knowledge, your business knowledge, and that's how you add value. In that particular scenario, I was able to introduce the engineers and the troubleshooting personnel with a digital power quality vote meter. That's probably pretty, you know, not, not, not inspirational here for you guys, but 20 plus years ago, that was a relatively new concept. Not only did I introduce that in a collaborative fashion, I had guys that were 50, 60 years old that had never touched a computer before that were comfortable with not only installing it, but downloading it and analyzing it. What that did for them was that, that built trust that, hey, this young engineer out of St. Petersburg can actually help. What it did for me, it opened up doors for solving more problems and growing and learning. Um, that then evolves me to that third part of the slide where I moved into project management. Uh, in the early 90s, around 93, I moved down to the Lake Buena Vista office here in Orlando. That's on Walt Disney World property. And I had the opportunity to be the very first project manager for progress for Florida Power at that time over the Walt Disney World celebration project. A couple of things about that. Walt Disney World had their own power company. It's called Reedy Creek Energy Services, okay? And we actually beat them out in a competitive bid process to serve their own territory, okay? So it was Florida Power, TECO, OUC, and Reedy Creek competitively bidding for that area. We won it. So here comes old Linden popping up there. Do you think there was a lot of confidence and trust with the people that were there with Walt Disney Imagineering? It was the old traditional power company. They had these innovative ideas and solutions. They had beat the in-house utility out. So what did I do? Build a relationship. Got to understand them. Got them to understand me. And what was interesting about that particular scenario, Walt Disney wanted to do things that had not been done before in our utility. They wanted to place equipment in places that I, we had concerns that our operating personnel couldn't access. They wanted the latest, greatest technology that we can re remotely operate this equipment. There's a lot of things that they wanted that concerned my internal leadership team. 
because it was new to them. So did I acquiesce and say, well, we'll just stick behind the rules that exist at Florida Power? The answer was no. Clearly, the customer had a need. Clearly, there were opportunities to take technology and advanced technology to provide that solution. So I was successful with building that relationship for both the company and the customer. I was able to deliver service that they wanted. As a result of that, we built it cheaper, faster, and at a higher technical standard that our folks could operate. And what it did for me, it built trust for Walt Disney World that we actually could do it. Because it's not about Linden. That's another lesson in leadership. It was about securing that competitive bid process so that we can retain that customer. Then ultimately, it did open up opportunities for me where I moved on to engineering management and all those other things that Chuck talked about. And that simple formula is something that I used over and over again. Now, you should hear a simple message. I didn't pull out a slide rule. Yeah, we had those back then. I didn't pull out a calculator. I didn't solve any differential equations. I solved problems using an engineering method and by being collaborative. So I built trust. Okay, now I want to go to the next slide. And this is, a, this is an equation. And I'm an engineer, you're an engineer, and engineers like equations. So I wanted to make sure that I fit our need. <laughs> okay. Um, this is my equation as to how you build collaborative relationships and trust that leads to success. This is what I learned in my 22 years working at Progress Energy. It is what Progress Energy expects of me, and to be honest with you, this is kind of what I would expect of you if you were to come work at Progress Energy. So the first block is building relationships, right? You've heard me talk before about respecting people making sure that you understand that you don't know everything and that you believe that you don't know everything and you also believing that you can learn something from everybody, right? And uh, the other thing that you also have to do is have the ability to share information. If you hoard information and you don't share information, you don't make yourself more valuable. You actually hurt the overall entity which makes you more of a risk for the organization. Uh, you also need to get involved in the community. I started out this discussion that we invest 50 million, uh, excuse me, 40 million dollars in the community and we donate in over 9,000 hours. It's important that you understand the community of which you work in. That helps you build that respect. It helps you build those relationships. The next piece is what I think most people jump into when you first get out of college. You start wanting to deliver on your commitment. But one of the first things that a lot of people miss is they don't take the time to learn the business. You know, you, I, I was lucky enough to hire on where my first 18 months was around learning generation, transmission, distribution, power quality. It was, it was my job to learn the business. I was one of the lucky few that got that opportunity. And then the next step is taking your technical skills, taking what you learned about the business, and applying it. I call that operational knowledge. Then the third thing is that you need is you've got to understand what you like to do and do it. Um, I started out in business, was good in math, got an engineering degree. I like engineering, but I didn't necessarily want to be a person that was going to be in a cubicle locked up all day uh, calculating stuff. I wanted to move into project management type stuff. So as a result, I picked something that I like to do and I enjoy going to work every single day. I'm one of these people that hired on and 22 years later, I'm still working at the same company. I've had a lot of different jobs, a lot of different experiences. Matter of fact, since 1997, I've lived in the same house. So about 90% of the jobs that you see I had here in Orlando. And that didn't happen by chance, that happened by plan. I understood what I liked to do and I did it. Home searching. I made sure when I moved here in Orlando that I picked a home that I could travel to virtually every operating area that, I, that they had here in Orlando. So as I, as I was moved around, I was able to move to different positions without having to physically move. Um, add value. Um, we are paying you a salary. <laughs> we are looking for you to be able to deliver something back to us. But what I really mean by that is I go back to that 
the land opportunity is that, hey, they had a need. The customers had a need, the engineering group had a need, the troubleshooters had a need. I had some operational knowledge, I added value. I can look back at every single job, most of the projects I had, and I can point to where I've added value. Now, it wasn't adding value to make Linden look good. It was adding value to make the product, the project, whatever I was working on, better. Uh, continue to grow and learn. Uh, assess your skills. You need to know what your strengths, you need to know what your developmental opportunities are. You need to leverage your strengths, you need to develop on those opportunities, and you need to build new strengths. Okay, contract management wasn't a class that I took, but you know, I knew that negotiating with people was something important, okay? Vegetation management, I certainly never trimmed any trees before, but I developed on what it takes to develop trees. New technology is coming down the road. Uh, what's not new for you guys, what was certainly new for us, was me, uh, mobile meter reading. In 2005 through 2008, I was responsible for, one of my sections was responsible for meter reading. We had 360 people statewide reading meters, physically getting in a truck, physically coming to your house and reading a meter. Technology had advanced such that I could put mobile meter reading at your home, drive a vehicle by, such that we were able to change our workforce down to roughly 50 people that can do that. That's learning the technology, that's applying the technology to business, real business application. What's coming down the path now? Electric vehicles. Where does Progress Energy stand on the electric vehicles? We kind of like electric vehicles. Most people will ride during the day, and then they'll plug up at night, <laughs> and it'll generate more revenue. We're supportive of that. <laughs> but at the same time, where do we fit in? Well, we're working to have plug, uh, plug stations where these cars can kind of plug in. We want to help control where this happens. That's how you grow and learn, and that you help grow your business. Um, be a mentor, excuse me, get a mentor. Most people in college are good at getting a mentor, somebody that can kind of help them navigate through college and help them plan for the future. But what I've seen is a lot of folks, when they come to the company, they forget that you need the same thing. You've got to have a mentor. You gotta have somebody that's been there before, somebody that you can ask questions for. You're gonna be in a situation that you need to get somebody else's idea on. The second thing is also be a mentor. Um, it's been 22 years, May of 1989, since I graduated out of Florida State University. A lot of what we do has not changed, but there's also a lot of new technology. So when I'm mentoring a student, I'm also getting mentored. I'm being brought up to speed as to what's happening in the industry. I'm asking questions about their perspective on what's happening, so I'm being mentored at the same time. So get a mentor, be a mentor. It can happen at the same time. Uh, yes, you will have to read technical and uh, leadership material. Uh, as a leader, you have to stay abreast of the new technology. You ought to also take classes. I, I'm six hours away from my Master's of Electrical Engineering at USF. Sorry about that. It's been a long time. I know that's one of your main competitors. But, uh, but you've got to also continue to grow is the message there. Uh, the last part of this equation is trust. And trust is the most important ingredient in leadership. I can ask you for your trust, but you really won't give it to me. I build trust by the way I do things. So trust is kind of a full contact sport. So the very first thing you do is you gotta do the right thing. You gotta act with integrity. Meaning that people know right from wrong. We were taught that by the time we were the age of 12. And so when you're in a situation where you've gotta make a decision about people's lives, about different technology, you have to make the decision that's the right decision. It may not be the most popular decision, but it needs to be the right decision. You know, I could have actually wrote another chart and said this in opposite. You build trust by doing the right thing, you erode trust by not doing the right thing. Uh, taking action. Um, when 
uh, I was sent to Deland for that first assignment. No one told me to go there and fix a voltage quality problem. I saw it. I took action. I mastered the situation. What we're looking for is that type of leader to come in the organization. It builds trust. Share, excuse me, serve the greater good. Uh, it's, that actually is called the principle of selflessness. The opposite of that is the principle of selfishness. Uh, you will not have many people follow you if your decisions are based upon how it impacts me. People will see that. People will not trust you. So you need to make sure that if you want to get into leadership, understand it's about being a servant leader. It's about serving the people that work for you. Uh, share your mind. This is one of the most misconceived principles about corporate America. People believe that you're brought in and you're, you, you know, you're, you kind of all dress the same, you all look the same, you think the same. Reality, as a leader, you separate yourself by having the principle of candor. Speak in your mind. I understand what you're saying, but I see it differently than you. I hear what you're saying, but have you considered this? You have to speak your mind, especially as engineers. That's how you avoid shuttles blowing up. That's how you avoid bad things happening, is that people in that room, there's some, typically, you get eight, 10 people in the room, there's probably somebody in that room that knows something that you don't know. And if they are afraid to speak up, then something bad or some bad end result will happen. You have to have the ability to speak your mind. That builds trust. As a leader, I appreciate it, because I know you know more about the work than I. Um, be prepared. There's nothing worse, nothing erodes trust more than for a person conducting a meeting in a responsible position of not being prepared. The people are looking at you to be prepared because they depend upon you. Uh, share your knowledge. There is a general thought that if I have knowledge, it makes me more valuable, which is fair. But it's only when you share that knowledge that you become very valuable. If there are nine separate operating units working for me, and one operating unit is doing extremely well, and the eight other operating units are failing, collectively, we all are failing. If that one manager is not sharing that information with the other managers, he's ultimately hurting the entire organization. I'm going to talk a little bit later about win-win, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about synergies. But the reality is, is that you become more valuable if you've got a better way of doing something and sharing it with those other eight managers. Now all of a sudden, all nine of you are being successful and ultimately the entire organization is being successful. I certainly will recognize and reward that manager that shares in that way if versus the other way. Um, that builds trust not only in your leadership, but your peers. Uh, choose the right people and reward the right people. Um, I like a lot of folks at Progress Energy. I'm friends with a lot of people at Progress Energy, but I will not choose them just because I like them. Because from a trust perspective, you lose respect. I re do the same thing from a reward perspective. But what's not listed here, and it was something that I was uh, oversight on my part, is the principle of caring. You've got to be able to support your troops. Uh, I went to North Carolina earlier this week to be there out sleeping in a day's end that didn't have a remote control, didn't have Wi-Fi, it was terrible, I'm just joking. But I went there <laughs> to support the troops. I wanted to see how they were being treated. I wanted to make sure that they had the resources that they needed. I slept in the same hotel that they slept in. We had the same meals. I needed for them to know, because it's true, I wanted them to know that I cared for them and I wanted to make sure they had what they needed. So if you do these, three things, and then you conduct yourself in the fashion on the far right-hand side under trust, you'll have a very successful career. I was here in spring, and one of the students asked the question as to what Vinnie Dolan presented, who's our president and CEO, and said, hey, what are your favorite books? So out of the principle of preparation, I came prepared with that answer. And I spent a, a lot of time thinking about it because I read so many books, I could have probably listed 30 books up there, but thinking about where I was 23, 24 years ago, this is what I would 
cons ask you to consider. The very first book is called The uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. It was written in 1989 by a gentleman by the name of Stephen Covey. It has sold over 15 million copies over that period of time. It was the number one audio release for years. Uh, why is that so impactful for me? It taught me about having public victories and private victories and the principle of renewal. You first have to lead yourself before you can lead others. Then you have to constantly reinvent yourself and grow yourself if you're going to have sustainable leadership. So that book teaches first public victories. Be proactive, <coughs> begin with the end in mind, and put first things first. Be proactive. The example about the vote meter. The example, uh, begin with the end in mind. Where do I want to go in my career? Where do I want to live? Okay. What opportunities do I want to have? Hmm, I'm going to plan it such that I can build and live in this house, build it big enough that I can afford, but be able to move around and have opportunities. Put first things first. What's the real priorities? If you can do that privately, then and only then you can begin to lead others. Public victories, think win-win. If I'm having a meeting with you and I'm negotiating something with you and it's only about me winning and you're going to lose, we're not going to close many deals. You're not going to want to work with me. So whenever you engage in a situation, it's got to be win-win for both parties. Seek first to understand and then to be understood is his fifth principle. My mother did it more simpler. Two ears, one mouth. Listen twice as much as you talk. I've been working on that for 46 years now. I'm hoping to get that one ironclad. Uh, synergize. The example I gave around the one manager having a good best practice under safety and not sharing. That's not synergy. Synergy happens when he shares his best practice and that other person shares their best practice and then all of a sudden those other seven managers are now sharing. And the concept that Covey teaches is one plus one is greater than two. Individually, you're one. But when you put them together, ideas start building, and then all of a sudden, it's bigger than two. Uh, the last one is called renewal. Sharpen the saw. His analogy is that um, if you're trying to saw down trees in the forest, and you never stop to sharpen and all that saw, you're just going to work harder and harder and harder. So you've got to stop periodically, sharpen that saw, so that you don't have to work as hard. In reality, in the real world, it's about just retooling yourself, reading books and taking classes. So that was the very first book that I'd recommend coming out of college. And if you go back to the slide that shows the skateboarder and the engineer, that's at that zone that I think this book would be great. Um, the next book is called Soldier, Statesman, and Peacemaker. It's really the life lesson of George C. Marshall. Uh, this is a book that was recommended and required reading by our SVP back in 2005. And it's the most powerful leadership book that I've read to date. Uh, it talks about nine principles that a leader should possess. And a lot of them were underneath the trust category that I, that I shared. Uh, <clears throat> the principle of integrity, the principle of action, the principle of selflessness, the principle of candor, the principle of preparation, the principle of learning and teaching, the principle of fairness, and the principle of vision. George Marshall, most people who've studied him, only know him for the Marshall Plan that was put in place after World War II. But believe it or not, he had 40 years of military history prior to that time frame. What did he do? He took the U.S. Army from basically a, a third world army to the most powerful army in the world. How did he do it? Practicing those nine principles. There are, his life and the stories that he teaches is just phenomenal. That puts you in that mid-level leadership position on that chart where now you have to start making decisions about business cases, about people's lives, about all these different things and you need to have a good set of principles by which to operate your life. The last one that I'll put on this list is good to great. And this is a scientific one where ultimately a group of researchers took a look at stock market performance and they identified 11 companies that had significant growth 
over a 15 year period. It was just phenomenal growth. And then when they drilled down to sort of analyze it, they found something in common about the leader, the CEO, the executives of, of those organizations. They possess two skills, humility and professional will. And they also took a look at it from the opposite perspective. Companies that were in the Fortune 500 that are no longer in the Fortune 500. They found something interesting there. They had professional will, but they didn't have humility. Most of those leaders were charismatic. They stand up in front of the crowd, they have these visions, and they didn't do a very good job of planning. Everybody depended upon them as to what's the next step. That, that leader that was humble, that, the, that had humility, knew that he wasn't going to always be there. So he had a good development plan. He had good strategic planning, good succession planning. Because when he wasn't there, he wanted that organization to run effectively. And it's called a level five executive. So those would be the three books that I would share with you that if you use those could help you advance uh, through the actual leadership ranks. With that being said, I'm at a point where I would like to turn the floor over to Randell Rainey. He's a mechanical engineering student here at UCF. He worked with us throughout the summer and he had a good opportunity to see two things. The projects that he did were kind of unique and then he had a chance to experience our leadership and I'd like him to share a few stories. Thank you, uh, Mr. DuPont. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? Great. Good, sweet. Um, yes, um, as he said, I did have the, the pleasure to, to work with Progress over the summer. It's definitely an honor to be on this side of the audience. Uh, just last spring, I'm a senior um, this year, just in the spring of uh, spring a couple months ago, I was in you guys' seats, and just my little two cents. This is an, an, a really, really good course, so definitely take heed to everything um, that you hear in, the, in, the, in this course here. Um, over the summer, I did have the pleasure of working with Progress Energy. Um, I'll first talk about, I guess, what I did, and then second half, uh, more so what I, what I, um, what I noticed. Um, what I, did, I worked with a group called Asset Management. Um, you guys know them as, I guess, power lines out and about. You see them networking. Um, we call them feeders. So within these um, asset management plans, develops, and then sort of maintains these different feeders throughout the system to help keep the power on. And I had a couple of projects. Um, one, working with reliability, and reliability is, okay, why did this feeder go out? Um, what's causing this feeder to go out, and how can we prevent that from happening? So I developed and updated a program that will give you reports based on different categories to see how these feeders can be better developed. And then the second was more so, how, as you talked about a little bit about storm preparation as well. Um, in the event of a storm happens, power does go out sometimes because of transformers being out, cable being dug up and whatnot. How can we, what's the, the estimated time of restoration and how many resources do we need? So I developed a program that also did that as well. And then um, Progress Energy also wanted to make sure that I got a really good grasp of what um, distribution was all about within Progress Energy. And it, I did that through a plethora of job shadowing events, which is really, really cool. I got to go out with lead planning engineers, um, other lead engineers, op, what we call op center engineers, um, project managers, um, um, some trouble men and also the line crew, which is the guys that actually, you know, do the, do the dirty work, climb the poles out there, um, three o'clock, you call progress, your power's out, they get out of their bed, go in the bucket trucks, and take care of all that. So it was a really, really cool experience, and that's what I did. But also what I noticed, more so, I guess, leadership-wise and culture-wise, he touched a little bit about the, the phenomenal culture at Progress Energy, one being safety, but also the values and the people um, that they have as well. And my first interaction with Progress Energy actually came over, over a year ago, before I even came on as an intern, to a gentleman by the name of Ray D'Souza. And Ray D'Souza is a, he's a, uh, he's what you call a, a, a basically an engineer in management in the, the transmission department at Progress Energy. And he's been, been there for over 20 years now, and he didn't even know me, but through a gentleman that I kept in touch with um, through an organization out of high school, just, you know, keeping keep in contact with the guys. Um, through high school, I got in touch with Mr. D'Souza, and he was willing to meet with me. So right off the bat, I thought that said a lot about him. He didn't know me at all, but he was willing to meet with me. We um, started off just having breakfast and whatnot. And throughout, our, our, as our relationship grew, I noticed that he always treated me as an equal, which I really, really didn't like. I was a student, okay, you know, trying to get into the game and everything. And he, here he was as an engineer, very, very highly accredited, had been doing so for so long, but he always treated me as his peer. And I thought that was really great, his humility. That was the first leadership um, trait that I recognized. 
And then also, as we, we, he's my mentor now, meet up on like a weekly basis. And from the very beginning, he always wanted to notice, he always wanted to see how I wanted to benefit from the relationship, how uh, some things I wanted to aspire to do. And then he came up with these creative ways and proven methods that I can sort of accomplish these goals. And he even recommended, uh, because I'm a mechanical engineer, he even recommended that I look at other companies outside of Progress. Because I, just, I studied mechanical engineering because I wanted to work with turbines. That was what I originally wanted to do. And once he realized that, you know, Progress Energy at the generation stage, they do use turbines, but they don't develop them and they don't manufacture them. They get those from GE, uh, Mitsubishi, and whatnot. So he, he, told me, he told me to definitely look into other companies as well, which I thought was really great because he wasn't looking out for, he's clearly loyal to Progress. Been over 20 years now, but he wasn't looking out for just progress. He was looking out for my well-being as well. So that caring factor that he told you about supporting your troops, that was a, a, a next trait um, in leadership that I noticed as well. And then once I began my internship, um, I was introduced to Mr. Larry, Larry Bonner. I call him Mr. Bonner. Um, really cool guy. He was the, the manager that I directly reported to. Um, right, I didn't know, he, although he had been well over 20 years, he's been working in the industry. I didn't know that the role that he played over in Lake Mary, Florida, where I worked at, he had just been there for just a, a few months before I had gotten there. And I didn't know it because not only did, um, not only did he know everyone, everybody seemed to know him. And this is really key for me because I learned being at Progress Energy, it's not just who you know, it's who knows you. Okay, when you're not in the room, who can speak on your behalf in a positive manner? And that was something that I really keyed on too, the fact that Mr. Bonner can not only, I guess, establish these relationships, but then on top of that, be able to, be able to maintain them he, over 26 years ago, when he first became, I guess, out of college, uh, started as an engineer up in New York, he, a gentleman that, the gentleman that hired him, he, could, I saw him pick up the phone, talk to this guy on a regular basis, I mean, just like, like, just like they had just met each other last week. So keeping these contacts fresh will like, not only help you to matriculate through an organization, but also help you to better, uh, you can be much more effective. You can be much more effective at the current position that you hold as well. So that was a really, really key point. And then another one that I learned, which was not just not necessarily from my management, but also amongst my peers. Um, I was, you know, right in my office, I was with other engineers, and not just engineers, engineers that have been proven, have been in the industry for quite some time now, lead, other lead engineers, and they had no, I guess, no, um, they weren't mandated at all to teach me what they did. But everybody was more than willing to come over to, you know, my little cubicle, okay, out of their corner office, and they would sit down, um, help me out. I had, because I'm mechanical, I had no um, knowledge of, not much knowledge of the power industry at all. I didn't know much about Excel, macros, VBA, and all those coding and whatnot. But they would sit down with me, help me out, and to help me to develop that knowledge and really get up to speed. So the willing, willing to be willing to teach and also share that knowledge, as Mr. Dupont touched upon, was another aspect that I noticed at, um, at Progress Energy as a whole. Okay, so that's the, the humility, the caring, the networking, and then also the being willing to teach and share others as well. Just a, I guess, a small pinch of what I experienced at Progress Energy. So, awesome. Thank you, Randall. As you can see, and again, Randall wasn't paid to say that, but as you can see, that it's just not about Lyndon DuPont believing in those values. It's really about the leadership culture that we've established. This is our standard as to how we're going to do business. And as a result, it's transcended throughout the entire organization, because that's really what leadership is about. Uh, as I conclude, I would like to sort of bring a couple of points back up to kind of wrap this up. Engineering is a great profession. And I had a VP by the name of Rodney Gaddy ask me this question in 2002. Once an engineer, always an engineer? To my rebuttal to him was yes. It teaches you how to solve problems. It's an approach at analyzing things. It helps you develop solutions. So yeah, once an engineer, always an engineer. That simply proves that you have the smarts to come in and to deliver results. But companies are going to hire you for that, but what's going to keep you employed and keep you advancing is more than just your smarts. It's going to be how you go about treating people. It's going to go about how you build those relationships, how you build those trust. You've got to deliver value. There's no doubt about it. And you've got to also continue to grow. So those are some of those messages that I would like for you to walk away with. 
Uh, that, simply been, that was simply my formula for success. There are many different formulas for success. You'll be probably up here in 20 years sharing your formula for success. But this is kind of what I found in my career upon, and I just wanted to share that with you. I have one last story, then I'll open up the floor for questions, and I'm going to tie something together. In 2004 and 2005, I was responsible for resource management. And what that means is that I was a person that pretty much calculated and decided how many different engineers, line crews, whatever we needed to do our normal day-to-day -day work. Something happened during that time frame where we needed to ramp our resources up from around 2,000 to 10,000. It happened to be Hurricane Charlie, Jean, and Francis, okay? And then we ramped our tree resources up from 500 to around 4,000. How did that come about? Believe it or not, it was relationships. Could pick up the phone, talk to companies that we had been dealing with, and they were willing to give us those resources. And we did that ramp up in two to three days. Okay, so that's the part of the value that's provided. Now let me kind of take it in uh, further along. Once they got here, we treated them with respect. We had the work organized. Everything was planned out. Believe it or not, when that second hurricane hit, many of those contract companies were calling us saying, we want to come back and work for you. You can't buy that. You can't ask for that. It's how we go about demonstrating our respect for people when they come here and we treat them well. So ultimately, I just wanted to share that with you that, hey, it adds value and it works. At this particular point, I will open the floor for any questions that you may have. Okay, I can't hardly see. Oh. Coming from over in St. Pete, I know you guys are really involved in community over there and over here as well. Um, back to the electric vehicles, what are what are we looking at as far as like plans on getting those systems integrated any you know any time in the future here? Uh, we are a big supporter, as I stated before, of the electric vehicles. Uh, we've actually been here to UCF before with Ford to talk about our plug-in vehicles. So we are really, we, we're not building them, but we're certainly supporting them, communicating them. We actually have several of those electric vehicles parked at our parking lot, but we see that kind of as a wave of the future. Unfortunately, at this point, the cost of those vehicles are so high. You're talking around $50,000. And the good news, though, is the cost for it is about one-third to one-fourth the cost of gas. And so uh, with the incentives, right now we just don't see the market, but hopefully over time the cost will start to go down a little bit and that market will grow for us. But we definitely see that as a wave of the future. How we will be impacted, we'll be kind of the guys that will be having those plug-in stations or serving those plug-in stations where people can plug those cars in and we can get that revenue. Thank you. Yes. Who was your mentor and how did he help you progress through your leadership aspect and how, what questions did you ask him to become beneficial in your, in your current standing today? Um, the answer to your question is I can't just pick one, but I can give you a couple of examples because I think as you progress throughout your career, you need to continue to evolve and your mentors can evolve with you. But uh, I'll pick one that was near and dear to my heart first out of college. It was a gentleman by the name of Daniel Woodall who still works as our company. He's the director of our smart grid system out of the Carolinas. And uh, he was the gentleman that helped develop me even more about understanding the importance of making decisions and understanding the impact of the decisions downstream. As most engineers, we look at things on a numerical basis and we don't always understand the impact that uh, you have when, uh, for people and systems. Another particular gentleman that helped me out along the way is a guy by the name of Keith Blandon. Keith is from Arcadia. He's from a small town like I'm from, and he had been with the corporation about eight years. And as I moved into these larger positions, I'm kind of a humble, uh, shy type of guy. Keith helped me to be able to develop the confidence to stand in front of an audience like this and be able to share. So uh, I've had many, and each person's almost like superheroes. They have different powers and different skills that they've been able to impart with me. And I, uh, uh, Dan Woodall, going back to him, uh, he's the person that made sure that, hey, we talked about where I was needed development. He would help me point me to people in the organization to consider to hook up with. Keith Blandon was one of those guys. So uh, long story short, I, I just can't pick one, many, and I'd recommend you to have multiple as well. Okay? Yes, the gentleman in the red. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the uh, 
CEO of Facebook was recently quoted as saying that he would rather have one great person than a hundred good people. As a leader, what's your thought on this position? Uh, wow. Um, <laughs> I don't know in what context that, that quote was made. Um, I would rather have one person that is going to act with integrity, do the right thing, be s not be selfish, than to have 10 people that exude those other qualities or 100 people that have those other qualities because what will happen is that you'll ultimately fail. So I don't know in what context that, that he quoted that in. Uh, and, and, and one thing that you've got to understand, having super power and super intelligence doesn't necessarily translate into just great success. If that person has all those people skills, you know, that, that, that how I, that's how I would measure uh, success. That was a good question. Wow. One more question? I'm getting the signal. Uh, this gentleman, on second from the back. Yeah, you with the, I can't tell what color shirt that is. <laughs> Absolutely. For, I would imagine that for most companies that would involve downsizing that department. Mm -hmm. How does a, a company that uh, has philanthropic tendencies sort of reconcile the desire to be philanthropic with implementing technology that leads that could lead to downsizing? That, that's a great question, and I'll share with you that what makes the paper are the companies that don't do it correctly. And because when I presented that, I thought somebody may ask that exact question. Here, here's the deal. Uh, technology through the entire history of the world has reduced the amount of labor and effort to get things done. So you need to know that's going to be a wave of the future. Now, how you, to answer your question, how you go about doing that is you do it on an ethical fashion and you do it with care and compassion. If you know this technology is coming and you know that you're heading in this direction, what you do is you are transparent. You share that with the individuals that are going to be impacted. Second thing you do is you start taking their skill sets and you start identifying them and mapping them to different positions within your organization that you can, that they can perform. And then you implement that technology over a period of time to give them an opportunity to navigate to those positions so that you don't have to lay people off. And we've done that many times. As a matter of fact, another brief story, I'm going to get the hook here shortly. Another brief story is that in 2008, I led something called the Workforce Assessment. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying that, hey, the economy was going down. We were no longer setting 50,000 meters a year. We were only setting around 10,000 meters a year. We were staffed to be able to set 50,000 meters a year. Hey, Lyndon, you need to go bring back an organizational design that allows us to have sustainability through this tough economic times. Uh, we reduced our workforce count by 300, but we didn't displace anyone out the door. We did exactly the same thing. Hey guys, tough times, here's where we got to get to, here's what we're going to do is give you time, and we're going to sort of phase this in so that we don't have to lay people off. So that's what we believe, and that's kind of the reason why our culture is what the culture is. Good question. Uh, with that being said, I better turn the floor over to you, Chuck. Please join me in thanking Mr. DuPont. <laughs> for a guy that can't keep a job for very long, we're pretty impressed. Thank you. It's a great story. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you so much.